Wetlands are among the most scarce natural resources on Earth. In Nebraska, our wetlands provide a crucial habitat for North America's migrating water birds, along with endangered species such as the least tern and piping plover. Wetlands help flood control and filter out pollutants before they reach the groundwater that we use to drink. In their natural condition, Nebraska's wetlands are among the most productive ecosystems in the world. One of the, the neat things about wetlands is they're such an attraction for all types of life. A wetland, obviously, I mean, in its simplest term, is, is land that is wet, so it's obviously that's why it's called a, a wetland. The biggest misconception people have is that wetlands have to be wet all the time. Often uh, this one will go dry, as many other wetlands will go dry. A wetland is defined by three characteristics one of which is the presence of water, you've got presence of plants that, that like to grow where there's water, and the final factor is the soils, or, or, the, or the dirt and, and soil that these plants are, are growing in. The soils take on certain characteristics when they're wet. So the only time you're going to have a wetland is when you have all three of those things lined up. The, the water, the right types of plants growing, and soils that have taken on those kind of wet characteristics. Nebraska has nearly three million acres of wetlands. You can find a wetland in all 93 counties. In fact, there are more wetlands in Nebraska than any surrounding state. Nebraska has a great diversity of wetlands. We'll visit Alkaline and Sand Hills wetlands in the west, the Platte River wetlands in the central region, the Rainwater Basin in south-central Nebraska, and Saline and Missouri River wetlands in eastern Nebraska. Several saline or salty wetlands lie in or near Lincoln. How many black terns do you have out there? Yeah, it looks like there is a, a dozen of them. For the eastern saline wetlands, they're very, very restricted in their distribution. They only occur right around the city of Lincoln. You cannot find these saline wetlands anywhere else in the state of Nebraska. Wildlife biologists regularly survey the condition of the Jack Sin saline wetland near Lincoln. Primarily what we've been doing on, on these wetland areas are, are shorebird surveys. We've seen some pretty significant declines because of the loss of wetlands, the loss of grasslands, uh, the loss of rivering habitat. And so um, we feel it's pretty important to be collecting this information on those species. We're looking at the, the spring migration. Birds have you know, wintered south of us and they're headed back north to uh, uh, nesting areas. But that same kind of thing occurs in the fall. This area offers a safe year-round environment with food and running water, even during the coldest days of winter. When we first start seeing shorebirds come through here and, and uh, about in March, as soon as, soon as uh, the winter starts releasing its grip, the, the water areas start thawing. We were looking uh, using the sweep net to look for invertebrates, you know, small insects and other, other zooplankton and life within the water, just to, to give an idea of uh, what kind of food, foods are out there for the birds that have been using this area. You can see why they're, what those birds are after out here. There's just a smorgasbord of different invertebrates. You know, we call them invertebrates. Uh, basically, they're insects, uh, worms, snails, little crustacea, which are related to like uh, 
uh, shrimp, there's little freshwater shrimp that occur in these areas, and so that uh, provides an excellent food source for the birds using the wetland here. Uh, the frogs uh, certainly are very important as a prey source for some of the birds. Some of the frogs are very small, like thumb-sized. They make a good prey source for those birds. Pollution and sediment are naturally cleansed by the wetland. Wetlands soak up water like a sponge, keeping our homes safer from flooding. Here at Jackson, water levels are controlled by biologists to maintain a healthy habitat. We've got a lot of, of grassland around the wetland, and so some of the birds, especially those you know staying around here to nest, are going to, uh, to nest in those, those grassland areas uh, surrounding the wetland. Not all birds nest here. Other birds use this area as a stopping point along their migration. Some of these birds are migrants, long distance migrants. Uh, um, some of the yellow legs that we see are, you know, they, they may have spent their winter down in uh, Central South America, um, the Gulf Coast, and are on their way through Nebraska. They're not gonna stay here and nest, but they're gonna go clear up into, um, up near the Arctic to nest. If you got people out here looking at these areas and, and the life that it supports, you know, I, I think you would, uh, there wouldn't be many people that would be against saving these wetlands. Statewide, 35% of Nebraska's wetlands have been lost to agricultural practices and city growth. In some parts, 90% of the wetlands have been lost. Wetlands are rapidly disappearing near Nebraska's cities and towns. Fontenelle Forest preserves one of the last remaining wetlands along the Missouri River in the Omaha area. Fontenelle Nature Association, in this particular part, we have about 1,400 acres, and it is a preserve. Students from Omaha Benson West get hands-on experience as wetland scientists, searching for tiny creatures living in a Nebraska freshwater wetland. But it's now swimming in the water. Using their investigative tools, you know, using their hands and their eyes and all of their senses to get into the environment. And it's great because a lot of these kids haven't had the opportunity to come out here before. And also, they're helping us figure out what our indicator species are here. You know, if we have mayflies, we're having good water quality, or if we're, if we're finding other species. And we kind of record those, and, and throughout the years, we can see if we're having good quality water down here. Oh no, snail. There's so many snails in here. I got all these. I wanted to get them all together. Oh my. It jumped off. Good job, guys. A little baby fish, and it's very colorful. I love it, but I'm going to put a baby in the water so it won't die. And there's a green. Some of them are learning that they can actually do something they never thought they could. Like, even from the walk from the building down here, I had a couple that said, I'm not touching anything, and now they're the ones most excited running up here showing everyone. Two baby, baby snails, um, two more snails, a fish, a big snail, a major sized snail, and I don't know what that is. You want to put them in your tub? Okay. Very gentle. Good job. Good job. You guys did a nice job finding stuff. Wetlands like this one at Fontenelle help control flood damage and are great for wildlife and recreation.
In south central Nebraska, millions of water birds use the rainwater basin for resting and feeding each spring. The Rainwater Basin is a 4,200 square mile landscape in the center of the North American continent. Millions of birds depend on the Rainwater Basin to rest and put on body fat before continuing their migration into the northern United States and Canada. Wildlife conservationists manage the wetland vegetation to help guarantee a ready food supply each spring. Um, a lot of what you see growing here um, is a type of smartweed uh, that is actually, it's an annual smartweed that produces a lot of, a lot of seeds. That is a favored food of, of ducks and many other bird species, um, and so we like to see a lot of this growing in our wetlands. Edible plants in shallow water produce a nutrient-rich habitat for birds. But reed canary grass, an aggressive weed, can take over and choke out nutritional plants. Right here, side by side, we have two of the plant species that are common in this wetland. Um, we have both the reed canary grass, which is the, which is the plant that we are trying to get rid of here with this project, uh, growing right next to the annual smartweed. The rainwater basin is like a bowl that stores water. Over time, due to erosion, the bowl fills with soil or sediment more rapidly than natural, so less water can be stored. To reestablish this area of the basin, conservationists excavate and remove layers of soil from the wetland and replant good vegetation. Where we did the project, you can see that contrasting over here where we scraped about six inches of sediment off of this area. And now you're starting to get a lot of the, the annual plants moving back in, such as the smart weeds that are growing, starting to come in here. Uh, those are good. Before modern agriculture and wildlife biologists, the plant growth in the basin was managed by prairie fires and large herds of grazing bison and elk. Today, we don't have bison and antelope and elk here in the rainwater basins. And so we need to find a substitute to help us manage the vegetation and kind of keep the vegetation under control. And so we utilize uh, cattle uh, to graze this reed canary grass uh, during the growing season. For the most part, ranchers and farmers are stewards of the environment, um, but there's some grounds like these that really, besides maybe some grazing, uh, you know, farm-wise, it's just not suitable for that. And uh, we've actually, with the rains this year, we've built our herds a little bit because we know when that we have the wetlands to graze. So it is very beneficial for us. Hi, hey Brian, how are you this morning? Good. Good to see you. Yeah. Here on the rainwater basin, ranchers and farmers work with wildlife managers to ensure that the spectacle of wildlife returns every spring. I just had my first kid two weeks ago, Joshua. We do want this around for, for him to see. North of the Rainwater Basin in central Nebraska, acres of grain fields, native grasslands, and wetland meadows along the Platte River create a perfect environment for the spring gathering of sandhill cranes. For 10 million years, sandhill cranes have found their way to Nebraska. Survival of this living dinosaur is due in part to human efforts to save the species. 
to track the location and health of the sandhill crane population, wildlife biologists sometimes use extreme measures. Decoys are used to coax sandhill cranes to feeding areas, such as this wetland meadow. A large net is camouflaged. At the right moment, rocket charges launch the net. Birds are covered to help calm and prevent injury. Blood samples are taken. Birds are identified with a band, and one is banded with a satellite transmitter. Once the information is recorded, cranes are safely released. Ready? One, two, three. Yo! There's really very little known uh, on a lot of things of these birds. They're very, very difficult to work with. They're very difficult to capture. There just hasn't been a lot of research done on them. This is a picture here of, of most of our satellite um, radio or satellite marked cranes uh, since we've begun the project. Some of these birds travel as much as one way, uh, around 4,000 miles. So from breeding grounds to wintering grounds, like these birds here, are covering approximately 4,000 miles. Having a long-term record of the movements and health of sandhill cranes will help ensure their return to the central Nebraska wetlands every spring. Traveling northwest, wet meadows along the central plate give way to rugged grasslands and towering rock formations in the panhandle of Nebraska. There is definitely some historical significance of this particular area because of the, uh, the various trails, westward trails that went through this area. Many of the wetlands in Nebraska's panhandle are alkaline. Western alkaline wetlands collect salts by evaporation, whereas the eastern saline wetlands that we visited earlier, the salts come from groundwater. It's just like if you, you put salt water in a pan on the stove and boil that down, you're left with, with kind of a salty crust in the bottom of the pan. And, uh, you know, it's a real similar thing here. It's just, as you get the water, the salts kind of dissolve and move into these low spots, and then as the sun evaporates that water away, you get this crust that forms. It's kind of weird how we have uh, the combination of fresh water and, and these alkaline wetlands in close proximity. Here at Falka Springs, we have a freshwater spring on the north side of the highway that, uh, that flows off to the northeast, and then just nearby we have these alkaline wetlands. Groundwater is a vital source of drinking water. 95% of Nebraska's drinking water comes from groundwater. In some spots, groundwater boils up from underground to create freshwater springs. Groundwater is the lifeblood of the sandhills in northwest Nebraska. The Sandhills region stretches 265 miles across Nebraska. It is the largest sand dune area in the Western Hemisphere. Much of the Sandhills landscape is dry grassland, yet there are numerous lakes, marshes, and wet meadows. Wading through murky ponds and streams is a fun way to explore the diversity of a sandhills wetland. Yes, yes, we have the first stickleback. Uh, Sarah, make a note, we got a stickleback in here. They're not native to this area according to the fish and game maps. Okay, up. Very good. 
studying aquatic life in this living laboratory helps provide information to maintain a healthy sandhills habitat. Crayfish are, are an absolutely a predator on these small fish. Here's another sickle right? Dr. Platts and his students from the University of Nebraska spend the summer doing research along the North Platte River at the southern edge of the Sandhills. The area is downstream from Nebraska's largest body of surface water, Lake McConaughey. This exercise is generated so we could get long-term data in a place where we have uh, a chance to come back every year and sample them to see how they're doing. So this is sort of a laboratory in a way. Okay, good work, crew. In the heart of the Sandhills, cowboy poet and rancher A.B. Cox relies on an abundant supply of groundwater to spring life into his Sandhills ranch. So this is a crick. Yeah, this is the actual quick there, bottom. Yeah. And it's kind of a rare year that you can cross this. Usually there's always water flowing. Hopefully yeah, get. or at least standing. Here on A.B. Sandhills Ranch, a very dry meadow can be wet just beneath the surface. Sometimes, you know, if you let those holes stand a while, the water will seep in. And we're what, probably, yeah. you know, probably two and a half foot down there, if yeah. that. We have kind of an unspoken covenant, you know, to be good stewards. You know, not just to the grass, not just to your community, but to the, to the land and to the aquifer and to the to the water and the hydrology of the sand hills, you know. We've been kind of entrusted to look after it by good fortune, bad fortune, circumstances. And that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. A.B.'s respect for this dry and wet land is expressed in his Sand Hills poem. The wind, the grass, and the water the things that never do change. They differ from season to season, but for eons are always the same. And the grass in summer is cattle, fat to the heart with the flower, and the deer, the coyotes, and game birds are fruitful palms of the power. In winter, grass brown, hard, and handsome, wind biting, breathless, and fresh, and water cold, hard, and lonely, it puts the soul to the test. And when the wind blows my ashes through the bunch grass and settles in the prairie sand reed, and the water soaks my bones to the yucca, heaven is all that I'll need. Then spring comes, and wind brings the water, and sun, the mystery above, a waving patch of blue stem, I'm part of the land that I love. And then the cycle is over, the seeds mixed with dew dung and sand, and life, so fragile with beauty, renews itself over the land. The wind, the grass, and the water, the essence of this sand hill land, I'll be here through the eons. You've mixed my soul with the sand. I guess I've always been drawn to, to wetlands uh, fr from uh, the time I was as, as young as I can remember. They're just these little jewels that are, are green and, and have water and uh, abundance of wildlife, thousands of different types of plants and, and animals that occur in these areas. And so what really draws me to these, and a lot of other people as well, is just a place to have available to have that type of enjoyment. They're just a fantastic place to come and, and see different types of wildlife and enjoy the outdoors.
For more information, please visit the Wetlands of Nebraska website. Wetlands of Nebraska is made possible through a grant from the United States Environmental Protection Agency with additional funding by the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications, and by Ducks Unlimited. <laughs>